it's really good to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, we're going to be preaching today from the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, please open there. Uh, we're going to be preaching from chapter 1. Let me just, as you do that, let me give you uh, a, a little snapshot of what's going on in my life uh, so that uh, some of you might have questions who know me. Uh, I am married to Joan. She still is my wife. Hallelujah. And, uh, but she's not with me today because she's in Kenya, and uh, she's there with uh, my son, Given. And uh, Given was a missionary in Kenya for several years, married a Kenyan uh, named Juliet. They have three children, uh, so they're over there visiting uh, right now. Um, I have four children total and 15 grandchildren. And uh, so my son Michael is still active duty in the Navy in Norfolk. My son Garrett is a special agent in the FBI in, outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, my daughter, Curran, is uh, married to a uh, RTS Jackson grad, and he's a chaplain at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And so they're up there. So that's just a quick uh, review of where my kids are and, and what we're doing. But... In the mercy of God, I can't seem to retire. Every time I come to the end of uh, a role, God puts me somewhere else. When I took this job at First Press, they said, how long you got? And uh, <laughs> I said, gosh, I don't know. It's like I'm at the age now when somebody says, got a minute? I said, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so... So I'm going to uh, uh, pray, and then I'm going to ask you to stand up as we read the Scripture, all right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day, another Lord's Day. It is your day, Lord. We come to worship you, come to tell you how great you are, because you are great. And you are merciful to those of us who are sinners. And Lord, even as we come to the Lord's table uh, today, we pray that you prepare us that we would be mindful, Lord, of what it cost you to pay for our sins, and that we would be full of joy and thanksgiving that you love us so. Holy Spirit, come and anoint me to preach your holy word for your glory. Please, please, Lord, help me. In Jesus' name, amen. So would you stand with me? We're going to begin reading from verse 4 of chapter 1 of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The title of my sermon today is Pursue the Plan. And I should have called it Get with the Plan, but it would ruin my alliteration. So it's Pursue the Plan. And planning is really important. You know, they say those who uh, fail to plan usually accomplish it. And some of you right now may be thinking about spring break. and you know, you might be saying, okay, what is my husband thinking? What is my wife thinking? The kids are thinking, what are my parents thinking? Or I don't care what they're thinking. I, I hope we do this, you know. 
And sometimes there used to be arguments in the family I grew up in. There would be arguments about holidays because I would come home from college or seminary, and, and sometimes there was conflict over, well, we had planned to do this. And I said, well, I had planned to be with my girlfriend, you know, and sometimes there's those kind of struggles that go on. Uh, Mike Tyson, uh, who is a famous boxer, uh, he, he said, you know, people would plan how to fight him. He said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And usually circumstances hit you, and all of a sudden, all your plans just seem to fade away. When I was in the Army, they even had a training manual called Plans and Operations, and they would spend a lot of time helping us learn how to plan. Well, God has a plan. And God has a plan that he reveals here in the Word that we read about. This is, uh, by the way, a very Trinitarian uh, experience, what, what, what happens here in Acts chapter 1. You'll notice that the Father is involved, and the Son is involved, and the Holy Spirit is involved. And so I've got four points that we're going to go through as we look at the text, and we'll see uh, what God's plan is. And, and I, I really hope that you will see your part in that plan. This, this is something that does, it does, does concern you, and you ought to make it personal. It's not just what happened to the apostles. It's what ought to be happening to us. And by the way, you are allowed and free and encouraged to say amen when something I say is true, okay? If you don't agree with it, keep quiet. Okay. <laughs> God has a plan, and he has made a promise. The first point I have is promised by the Father. And we see this here, that Jesus talks about receiving what the Father has promised uh, in verse 4. So you are to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, uh, you heard from me, John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Now, he's referring to what's going to happen in chapter 2, which is the fantastic, amazing, wonderful outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the disciples. They were in an upper room. They were waiting. They were doing just what Jesus had said to do. And they were praying. And the Spirit came upon them. And it was as if tongues of fire were behind each one of them. And then they began to speak. And they spoke in tongues. Now, these were known tongues. That is, these were languages. They hadn't gone on Duolingo or anything else to learn. They had all of a sudden miraculously begun uh, to speak in tongues. And, man, I wish I had had that gift in Greek class, in Hebrew, and any other languages I've tried to study, but uh, I didn't get it. I had to study instead. But God did it for a purpose. He did it to convince all the people who were listening to them, that now he was present in power in their lives. That's what we call the day of Pentecost. And so they spoke in these known tongues. And if you are careful to read it, you'll see that there were all kinds of people there from all the nations in, around uh, who were present on the day of Pentecost. They were Jewish, but yet they had grown up in different cultures and different nations, and they spoke different languages And so when they heard the glory of God being revealed in their language, they were drawn, and they said, what's going on here? And and this is one of the funniest lines in Scripture. They thought they were drunk. And I think that's funny because I've never heard a drunk learn a new language uh, miraculously, uh, except mumbling. And here they were giving the praises of God. Many people were saved, thousands of people, Uh, came to Christ on that day because the Holy Spirit changed those disciples. Now, earlier, Jesus had breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit in preparation for this day. But when they received the Holy Spirit that day, things things happened to them that they, they didn't exhibit at all. When you read the Gospels and you look at Peter's life, he is so different. He stands up and preaches with such courage and such great theology, you know it was God. God was working in his life. That was the promise 
of the Father. Um, this promise Jesus talked about in uh, John 14 and 16. So uh, if you got your Bible, keep your hand there and just turn back a few pages. Uh, let's look at John 14, verses uh, 16 through 17. Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I, I want you to understand something about the Holy Ghost today, uh, in case you're not familiar with the, uh, these theological concepts of the Trinity. And the Trinity is a hard doctrine to understand. But we believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. the Holy Ghost. All right? And they're just one God, but there's an economy between them. They all have different functions. And the Father uh, sends the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who is also the Spirit of Christ. And it says here, He will dwell in you. So when you know when, when you hear people say, I pray to receive Christ, I ask Jesus into my heart, you receive the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Jesus came into you. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father in His physical body, His resurrection body. But His Spirit dwells in you if you are a Christian. And you might have asked the question, well, wait a minute, was I supposed to speak in tongues when I became a Christian? That happened at Pentecost. But since that time, when you believe in Jesus, and you are, as it were, born again by the Spirit of God, you have the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you're not a Christian. The only way you were able to become a Christian is because the Spirit of God opened your understanding to believe that there is a God, that He loves you, that Christ died for you, for your sins. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you were drawn to Christ. And now, for, for now on, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Hallelujah. Thank you. That was a good place to say amen. All right. <clears throat> now, in, in chapter 16... Verse 7, another word about the Holy Spirit and what He does. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus talking to His disciples. He's telling them He's going to die on the cross and that He's going to leave them. And they're struggling with this. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the parakaleo, the comforter, the counselor, all of those are words that are translated from this word, para, the paraclete. If I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will catch these three things. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This is what the Holy Spirit has come to do through you and through me. He's bringing this conviction to the world. He helps as you bear witness to Christ, He brings conviction to the world of their sin. As you live for Christ, He brings conviction to the world of righteousness. And He brings conviction to the world through the Holy Spirit that Satan is judged. Praise God for that. So my second point is we are powered by the Holy Ghost. Now, when you become a Christian, and, and by the way, thank you, Mark, for 
uh, the things you shared with us. I really enjoyed the little picture book uh, about a, a method for those of you who weren't in Sunday school. Uh, part of his innovation is to, to ha have new ways to share Jesus with people. And if any of you have ever been terrified about the idea of sharing Christ with a stranger, or even people you know, join the club. You know, even the Apostle Paul, he asked for prayer. He said, pray for me that I will have boldness when I share Christ. And you think, Apostle Paul, you don't need any more boldness. You're a crazy man. You shared Jesus with everybody. You kept getting stoned and whipped and thrown in prison for it. You know, what do you need? Bolton? But he, he obviously <coughs> has a very similar experience that all of us have, that we choke. Often, you know, most of us as Christians, we've heard most all our lives, we ought to share Jesus Christ. Have, have you not heard that? Have you heard that you ought to be a witness? This should not be new to you, right? But it's scary. Here's the good news. The power doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. If you don't, if you don't take advantage of that power, you will, you will never experience the pleasure, the joy, and the mightiness of God when you get to tell people about Jesus. It is darn Darn, darn right, downright miraculous when you see somebody come to Christ through you. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I, I want you to understand there's power in the Spirit of God who lives in you, and there's power in the message that you share. It is not your power. It's not your good looks. It's not your suave presentation. It, 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 it's not all the experience that you might bring. And believe me, I have learned more presentations uh, about how to share Jesus than you can imagine. I've tried to do it in all kinds of ways with all kinds of people, with people all over the world. Nobody comes to Jesus through me. If they come, they come because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel. And I've got to get my eyes off myself. You know, when that opportunity comes, if my eyes are only my, myself, what will they think of me? How am I going to do? Then I'm going to choke. The power is of God. You got to rely on that, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be tough sledding. My third point: this is on purpose. You are purposed to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm really focusing on verse eight, in case I haven't made that clear. And here is what the Lord Jesus says: You will receive power to His disciples and to us. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That's, that's the purpose of the Lord. You, you are to be a witness. A witness is somebody who can tell what they saw or what they heard. They, something happened that they experienced. It's not hearsay. You say, hey, I want to I bear witness about what happened to somebody else. No, I need to bear witness about what happened to me. Now, we Presbyterians, we have a problem right here. Because, you know, if you go to a Baptist church, you know, or a Pentecostal, you know, they're always asking, when did you get saved? You know, what was the day you were converted? And they, they you know, and most of us really enjoy uh, wicked people getting saved. Because as you listen to them, you know they needed it. You know, oh, thank God, you know, he was on drugs for years. You know, he was a murderer and, you know, uh, they did all these evil, wicked things. And finally they came to Christ and, you know, now we can sleep better at night. You know, they're, they're saved. And we Presbyterians, we, we, we're all into this covenant, you know, we baptize our children and uh, we, we, 
we have kids who meet with the elders and they want to share their faith and they say, well, I've, I've never known a day when I didn't know Christ, I didn't believe in Christ. And it's almost like they're embarrassed not to have a conversion testimony. And God forbid any of you would try to make up about yourself that you were worse than you were. I mean, you're, you're bad enough already, okay, but... <laughs> Our testimonies are all the same. They are all about the grace of God that saves you. Uh, if you don't have a horrific past that you can talk about to make it dramatic, that's okay because the drama isn't about you. The drama is about Christ, what he did for you. Your testimony is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your testimony is you are crucified with Christ, and you no longer live for yourselves, but Christ lives in you. It's all about Christ and what he did. The drama is his. The glory is his. He lived a perfect life. He did, died on the cross in your place, gave himself for you, bled for you, died for you, so that you might be forgiven. Prior to that, he lived a perfect life so that his active obedience might be applied to you by faith. He lived a perfect life, and he gave you that righteousness. You lived a sinful life, and he took that sinfulness on himself. The, the, the drama is Jesus. And the glory is Jesus. You got a testimony because you're a witness if Christ has truly saved you. Now, if you're listening to me today and you are not yet saved, then I do, I just beg you, please come to Jesus. Please come to Jesus before that judgment day comes. Like I told you, I'm old enough now, somebody says, God, a minute, I don't know. And neither do you. But I do know this, I've got eternity, because Christ did all that was necessary to save me. You are a witness of the love of Jesus for your soul. You are a witness that you were a sinner, and Christ has died for all your sins. There isn't one sin, past, present, or future, that he did not cover with his blood when he died on the cross. All your hope and confidence in, is in Him. No matter if all hell breaks loose, you are confident of this, that He loves you, and you are safe in Him. And you ought to tell somebody about it. You ought to be able to share that good news with other people. Uh, when I was in high school and I was learning how to be a witness, uh, they, uh, one of the ministries that had trained me was saying, the best way to tell you is to tell you how it happened to me. And you just share your own experience. That's called a testimony. And testimonies are powerful. They, they help people understand, okay, I can see how Christ has changed your life. Hallelujah. Now, the last point I have is place is part of the plan. You notice where he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, Jerusalem happened to be where they were. That's where they lived. That's, that's where they were in that upper room. That's where the day of Pentecost happened when they spoke in those tongues and they shared Christ with all these other people, and thousands came to Christ. They started where they were. It, this progression is not an accident. I mean, it's, it's obvious, it's logical. Of course, they would start where they were. But it's laid out not only for them, but for us. You start where you grow up. You start where you live, what you might call your Jerusalem. They started in Jerusalem, and then they went through all Judea and Samaria. Now, Judea was the surrounding area, and it was very compatible with their culture. Samaria marked a different culture. It marked a different religion. It marked different kinds of people. And that's really where a lot of friction be would begin to take place. Now, by the way, it wasn't Samaria that, that was hard for them. They got persecuted in Jerusalem. They got persecuted in Judea. 
So sometimes starting at home is not so easy. Now, I want to ask you this question. Are people the same or are they different? Thank you. Yes, both, both people are all the same and people are all totally different. Uh, One of the things that I think we have failed in the evangelical church to do is to train our people about culture. Culture is a powerful thing. It's it's the water we swim in, and we don't even know we're in the river. Um, What language am I speaking to you in today? Thank you. Good. Uh, I'm glad you can understand me. I hope you can understand me. Language is is culture. It's a product of of our culture. Everybody has a culture. And sometimes it's a little deceptive. You might be here in the South, and you might think, oh, we all are Christians, because that's our culture. And that's not true. There's, There's part of Southern living that's extremely wicked. It's all about sexual immorality. It's all about hard drinking. Nowadays, it's about taking meth. It's it's a messed up culture. And there are people around you, you might assume, well, they're just like me. And you don't know the 40 miles of hard road they've had to drive down to be where they are now. We can sometimes make assumptions, quick assumptions, differences between black folks and white folks between immigrants, uh, between those who are here legally and those who are here uh, illegally. Culture makes a big difference. There's a big difference between middle-class culture and poverty culture. Being able to have compassion and empathy for somebody who's different from you. Place is important in our attempt to spread the gospel. And one of the things we have to do is we have to pay attention to that culture. Like when it says here, you're going to be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria. When they cross that Samaritan line, you remember what happened to Jesus. You remember his joy at talking to the Samaritan woman and the the shock of the apostles when he did it. Most times they wouldn't go through Samaria. They would go around. They'd cross the Jordan River. And and going up the other side, so they wouldn't have to mess with those people. You know the story of the Good Samaritan and how that was a shock to them that the Samaritan was the hero of that story. Culture is a powerful thing. And it can sometimes prevent you from even paying attention that that person is there. We act as if some people are invisible because they're not in our culture. It takes a great deal of humility to be a servant to somebody else in their culture. And that is really the missionary gift. And I want one of the challenges I want to make to you as a congregation is that you, as you pray and think about missions, that you would begin to learn culture. Mark talked earlier today about uh, youth culture. And generations have different cultures. Your grandpa's culture, not the same as your teenager's culture. They think differently. They're beset with all kinds of struggles and temptations. Brothers and sisters, this is God's plan for you. You are to be a witness of the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ to everybody, starting where you are, going to your neighborhood, going to the next town, going to the different ethnic groups, going to the different socioeconomic groups, different language groups, to the uttermost parts of the earth. I noticed your mission statement. Everybody got that bulletin? On the front page is your vision and mission statement. Is that not on the front page? Right at the beginning? Could somebody read the mission statement out loud?
Okay, that's a pretty good statement. Making disciples. But I would challenge you that you left something out. Because before the sinners get to come here to worship, they need to be reached. You might want to add something to that, elders. You might want to add evangelism or outreach or mission. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you is go get the sinners and bring them in. That they might know what it means to have eternal life. Oh, Father, we pray right now for our friends, our schoolmates, our neighbors, the people we pass on the road, many of whom are so lost without hope and without God in the world. And we pray for them today that you would have mercy on them and save them and that you would use us to do it. Lord, we are inept. We are often afraid. We are scared, nervous, and sometimes unprepared. Help us, Lord, to be your witnesses. Holy Spirit, come and give us that power that we need to do your will, to accomplish your plan. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.